Hello, good evening. I'm Chris Herbert. I'm the Managing Director of Harvard's Joint Center for Housing Studies, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you tonight to our conversation with Don Layton, the housing finance system during the pandemic and beyond. Um, Don has been spending this past year with us as a senior industry fellow at the Joint Center. We are incredibly pleased to have him uh, as part of our group. He's been enormously productive. Um, we uh, have been looking forward to this event all winter, and of course, the events of the last few weeks have made, made us recast it a bit. Um, but Don, who is uh, the former CEO of Freddie Mac, uh, has had a long career in um, banking and finance, who is a self-described technocrat, um, has been spending the past year uh, using his platform at the Joint Center to help educate folks about the state of the housing finance reform system, um, and really helped uh, increase all of our understanding of how it operates, how it's been changing, um, and the direction for reform or the direction that reform ought to take uh, to ensure that the system is safe and sound and meeting its, uh, its required um, function. Um, obviously, with the pandemic, that has also uh, taken on a whole new set of stresses in the system. And so tonight's event, uh, we will begin by uh, Picking Don's brain and, and uh, with the work he's been doing, he released a blog for us last week about the stress points in the housing finance system that are being revealed by the pandemic. Um, and then we will turn and talk more broadly, the longer view about uh, changes to the housing finance system that have happened, that are still needed, and the prognosis for further change. Um, so the, the course of events we'll have tonight is we'll start with Don doing a brief presentation uh, to lay, give us a landscape of the housing finance system, to kind of level set our understanding of the scale of the system, the players in this system, and talk a bit about the reforms that have happened. Um, and then after that, Don and I will engage in a conversation first about the uh, impacts of the pandemic, uh, as I said, more broadly about the directions for reform. And in the last 15 minutes or so, we will uh, entertain your questions through the Q&A function that you should be able to find at the bottom of your screen. I think we're all becoming experts in Zoom over the last few weeks. I'll be looking for those questions to feed to Don. So, and then we'll end uh, the presentation at 7.30. So uh, with that, Don, are you, uh, are you ready to go? I'm ready. All right, so let me pull up your... All right, Don, okay. take it away. Before uh, flipping through the slides, I want to thank Chris for hosting this and the audience for listening during the, the dinner hour. Originally, this session was designed to be about issues related to exiting conservatorship by the GSEs, which is very much front and center these days, until the pandemic hit. So we've repurposed this to focus more on the pandemic, although if there's time, we'll, I'm happy to answer questions about the GSEs and exiting conservatorship. My general theme about the pandemic, as I already mentioned in my article Chris referenced, is that even though housing finance is not in the, at the center of this financial crisis as it was back 12 years ago, key choke points in housing finance are showing real signs of buckling. Uh, it's become, several of them are at the heart of stresses in the financial markets. And Again, the theme is that's because there wasn't a thorough and comprehensive review of the housing finance system 12 years ago, and it's time to have one now. So let me go to the slides. Next slide, please. These slides are just about uh, some basic facts of the system. Here's consumer loan assets in America, card, auto, and student. Lots and lots of focus on the growth of student loans and its troubles. Its size is $1.6 trillion. That sounds like a lot. But in fact, all three of these are midgets in comparison to housing finance. Slide, Chris. Uh, mortgages, residential mortgages in America, just single family, just first mortgages is over $10 trillion in the United States. It's by far the biggest asset class like that. Uh, if you throw in second mortgages and home equity loans and apartment house residential lending, it comes up to $12 trillion. So how big is $12 trillion? Well, as a comparison, Chris, slide please. The entire deposit base of every bank in America that's FDIC insured is only $13 trillion. So you literally are talking about an asset class as large as the entire banking system of the United States. So it is immense. Tons of money flowing through it in all sorts of ways. Next slide, please. 
So the question is, who finances these residential mortgages? And unlike card and like auto, over a series of uh, laws and uh, government actions starting in reaction to the Great Depression in the earliest years, even back to Herbert Hoover days, the US government has entered this sector as being so important that at this point in time, two thirds roughly of single family mortgages, this is first mortgages, is backed by the US government. That's 47% from the government sponsored enterprises of Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae, 18% from the Federal Housing Administration and the VA, and that gives you your 65%. And that's for credit backing. There are other things that other types of backing that exist, but these are the big ones. 25% by banks. Overwhelmingly, when a bank makes you a mortgage, it's being sold to one of the government agencies. And private label securities and all other is just 10%. So this is a government-dominated the largest source of uh, credit to American families is overwhelmingly government dominated. Next slide, please. So what's the result of this government dominance getting away from numbers into policy? Everything in it is, becomes a battleground for ideology. On one side, more of a, uh, a Franklin Roosevelt New Deal orientation of big government entering the economy to help people and change outcomes to help people on the bottom end of the economic scale. It's, uh, or on the conservative side is too much government, we want smaller government, we want more private sector. Tons of rent seeking, uh, it is all throughout the industry and uh, as the ex-head of Freddie Mac in conservatorship, I'm very honest, the biggest rent seekers around were probably the two GSEs prior to conservatorship, exploiting loopholes to make easy profits with hidden subsidies. And what you also get is what I'll call political micromanagement, if you think of Congress or administration officials, when they think of banking and the securities industry, they, they go, their role is to uh, have guidelines around it and guideposts to regulate it. But it's a fundamental uh, private sector driven company. Because government's so big in housing finance, it's viewed almost like a government agency in which there's laws and regulations to micromanage at very, various aspects of it. Uh, so it's not a fully regular commercial system. Uh, it's really quite amazing how much political interference there is. And I refer to this generally in my writings as extreme politicization far more than I ever saw in banking or the securities business. Next one, Chris. So uh, coming back to my theme, a lot of this politicization showed up that you don't have full post 2008 reforms. Dodd-Frank focused on the banking system, it focused on the securities industry called Wall Street heavily, but it was kind of hit or miss reforms with respect to housing finance. A few examples of things that were addressed, they took the GSEs and the home loan banks and created a new regulator, the FHFA. Thrifts were removed from a specialty mortgage regulator and given over to the main banking regulator, the OCC. The QM rule, qualified mortgage, which CFPB did, uh, one aspect of it was products. And they said that it was QM would not apply. You would not have safe harbor for products like teasers and over 30 year uh, uh, terms. This has been very well accepted as a great reform and a lot of support in the industry. And of course, during conservatorship, the GSEs were reformed heavily. They're Overly large and subsidized investment portfolios were, were reduced smoothly over a decade to much smaller size, and they only support the main business now. Credit risk transfer was invented and implemented in large size. So the GSEs are no longer sitting on a massive, uncon overly concentrated pot of uh, credit risk. The single security was invented to help get liquidity uh, between Freddie and Fannie. But there are other areas that reforms didn't come. There was no comprehensive review. One analyst referred to the banking, the, the housing finance system as a Frankenstein monster because it had so many different pieces in so many different places. Servicers have now come to the fore. Everyone understands mortgage servicers now, that especially the non-banks have real problems with their obligation to advance principal and interest to mortgage securities, uh, investors, even if it's not paid by the borrower. Tens of billions of dollars a month are going to be needed to do this, and they do not have the money to do it with all the forbearance programs going on. 
Uh, this is well known, it was well discussed, but it was sort of no one's job to really fix it. MSRs and the whole series of compensation for servicing, creating a volatile asset was never addressed, although well known. The GSEs, you need a reform capital requirement. Here it is 12 years after going conservatorship and it's not fully out. It's gonna hopefully get done this year, but it has been 12 years. And then there's the issue of whether reforms made to the GSEs while in conservatorship continue afterwards. Private mortgage insurers uh, didn't get reformed uh, at enough. They got reformed partially. Uh, you have, are there, is their capital requirement full? Is it the same as a GSE would have on the same risk? What about the fact that they don't end up covering all their insurance, the insured loans because they can retroactively deny some? And where, what about comprehensive regulation? Why are some key parts like servicers only regulated really for consumer things by the CFPB, but no safety and soundness regulation? So it's a real smorgasbord of some things done, some things not done. And guess what? A lot of the ones not done are not doing very well in the current crisis. Chris, I think we're done with the slides now. So uh, I, as I wrote in my uh, top 10 things to watch for stress tests, some have started to show stresses, some we know are in the works and have coming out soon in terms of problems like the whole issue of service or advances. And some of them won't show up for another bunch of months or quarters, like how big will the credit losses be? How bad will the economy be? How much will house prices decline? We don't know that yet, and those stressors are waiting to happen. So that's the introduction, Chris. I'm happy to let's go to Q and A. Well, let's go. Let's you and I have a conversation first, yep. Tom. So, um, you know, the, uh, that that gives us a great overview of the state of the housing market uh, as of two and a half weeks ago. <laughs> um, and obviously, what we're seeing now is uh, a black swan event like no other perhaps. Uh, I've heard people liken this to the 2008 crisis but happening rather than over the span of two years or over two weeks. Um, so the housing finance system like the rest of the economy is under enormous stress. Um, how would you say it's faring? Is it a source of strength, a source of weakness, some, somewhere in between? Yeah, uh, the housing finance system has so many different components, a generalization wouldn't fit. Um, I guess the whole point is certain key choke points are faring poorly. That's like the whole service or advancers. The first topic that the government had to get on is called MREITs, mortgage REITs. These are basically a special type of hedge fund that play a very large role in owning mortgage-backed securities that the GSEs and Ginnie Mae issue. Uh, and they're very levered and exposed liquidity pressures. And they started having them in the giant flight to quality that happened in, you're right, that two years into two weeks compressed uh, stresses on the markets. So you have some definite weaknesses. Uh, the strength has been interestingly shown by guess what? The GSEs. No one's talking about them having big problems. They, in fact, have been used slightly to help uh, the MREITs already by being able to help finance their positions. So it's unclear how, if they'd be strong if they were out of conservatorship, but in conservatorship, where the government's still supporting them, they are turning out to be a source of strength. Uh, overall, I'd give the housing finance system, however, a pretty mixed grade, maybe a C in strength. It needs more reform. Um. So learning from this episode, what can the government do to turn the housing finance system into a source of strength? Well, there's no one size fits all. I would love it when they're done addressing the issues that come up during the period, that when things uh, go a little quiet again, a year from now, a year and a half from now, to do the comprehensive review. So what kind of things can they do and focus on? Well. If mortgage REITs being too levered and too illiquid are a problem, some, they have to enter in and maybe put uh, liquidity minimums and leverage maximums on them uh, directly or indirectly. If the whole mortgage servicing model must be strengthened, the whole orientation here is how does it perform in a stress environment? The system advances, 
basically non-bank servicers have been promising the ability to make advances when they don't have the ability past a certain modest point. That has to be addressed. Uh, a line of credit from the Fed to rescue them now, which is being discussed, it's not clear if it'll happen or on what terms, is a short-term expedient. That's not a structural solution. At the extreme, they could basically get rid of non-bank servicers and put it all in the banking system where liquidity is more assured. Um, or maybe there's other ways to do it. But right now, uh, it's a problem. The system of mortgage servicing rights creating a highly volatile asset on mortgage servicers. Uh, people don't realize this, but non-bank mortgage servicers are almost always monolines. Their net worth got crushed the day the Fed cut rates on that Sunday because mortgage servicing rights go down in value a lot when rates go down and their net worth decline dramatically. This is not necessary. Uh, back in 2011, the FHFA director at the time, that was acting director DeMarco, even proposed a change in how servicing is compensated, which creates this asset that bounces around. The industry didn't like it because some people wouldn't make so much money on it. They could change that. It's called C, uh, switching uh, compensation from a 25 basis point uh, of principal outstanding to a fee for service type compensation. Then the MSR goes away. There's no asset. You just get paid for your services. So there's all sorts of issues like that. And this hasn't even gotten to the issue of credit risk. If we have a giant decline in house, house prices coming up in the next six months, if we have uh, massive defaults because people are unemployed, we're gonna have large credit losses. How do they fare this time? The banking system is much stronger. The GSEs are much stronger while under government control. So they won't transmit the problem, but how much losses do they have? What does that mean for the pricing of mortgages going forward and the terms for mortgages? Are we gonna have another foreclosure tsunami coming up we don't know yet, but it's going to test the whole system once again. Um, so we're getting a couple of questions that kind of relate to this topic, Don. I might try to weave them in. Sure. Um, one of them you kind of touched on, I guess, was the question of like, is this going to be 2008 all over again? Are, are we going to see the housing system uh, go into such a deep crash as we saw last time? Right? What, is this similar, different? What's the uh, I want to divide it up uh, into two parts. What is going to happen to housing and housing values and delinquencies versus the financial system? The financial system broadly has been dramatically strengthened in the last 12 years. Banks are capital levels are probably double. They're much more liquid. So the uh, financial systems transmittal of housing finance problems to other areas is dramatically reduced. So I feel good about that. But within housing finance, are we possibly going to see another giant uh, uh, stress on credit? The answer is possibly. It's too early to say. It won't look exactly like the last one because the last one had a lot of people who had uh, inflated values on homes and things. We're not talking about that. This will be more substantive, not a financial bubble popping, but a true economic downturn. Uh, that's a different type of stress, uh, but it's, it can show up in a decline, probably more orderly than last time, because there is no financial asset bubble here. Uh, and you can have lots and lots of uh, delinquency. I will mention that going into 2008, broadly, the ha housing lenders didn't know how to handle distressed credits. All they knew largely was foreclose. In the pressure of uh, the crisis last time, HAMP and modification programs have been developed, the forbearance programs have been developed, uh, maybe a HARP type thing with refinancing will occur, it's not clear yet, and that is shown up by the forbearance programs. Now, while I know uh, uh, legislation gave forbearance and six months and things like that in this legislation, in fact, the forbearance program was in place several years ago now of the six months and six month renewal as just handling troubled loans in a more regular situation rather than forcing foreclosures. So I think we'll perform better in, in it all. 
Uh, but the answer is stress levels could, depending on how things work, be very high uh, like they were last time. If the economy bounces back dramatically, then it won't happen. But if we settle in to a uh, double digit unemployment that slowly declines over the next several years, uh, we could be into uh, stresses and credit, but unclear if they're as bad as last time. Um, Don, as you showed in your slides, so 47% of the market is GSEs, another 17% FHA, then we've got 25% bank, 10% mm -hmm. other. Um, so we know that uh, the FHFA through Fannie and Freddie have mandated forbearance. Uh, HUD is also uh, mandating some more forbearance. What about the, the bank's book of business? Um, how will, that, will they be subject to similar um, either mandates implicit or explicit to uh, extend uh, forbearance? Uh, my understanding of the federal law passed is it only applies to the government agencies, which of course is two thirds of the market. Um, I would say uh, I am aware that the banks, uh, both by their desire to be flexible and not cause problems by making adding fuel to the fire, uh, are looking to do things to be flexible. They've learned a lot also in the last 12 years, but I'm not aware of a centralized program yet. Um, and someone asked about the non-QM market, um, what the impact would be. Obviously, that has been slow to recover, very slow to recover post-crash. Uh, uh, what's the implication for that market of this? Yeah. Crisis? Um, I view the non-QM market as part of the PLS market. And uh, although some of it can be owned by banks, but not much. The PLS market has proven itself to be very volatile in the sense of when the when markets are robust and positive and prices are going up, it's vibrant and it tends to disappear very quickly in stress market times. So the entire PLS market is gone to almost zero uh, and uh, at this time. And so the QM market has gone to almost zero because that's where it's sold into. PLS market largely is jumbos and non-QM. And so those have large disappeared. Jumbos may be kept by banks on their balance sheets, but I'm not aware of anybody looking to own QM uh, assets from among the banks at this time. Don, one of the questions we got from uh, participants is uh, the fact that after every one of these crises, the government role seems to get bigger. Um, do you see the government role getting bigger coming out of this? Ooh, that's a very big question. I'll, I'll stick to housing finance. <laughs> The government role is already 65%. Um, uh, so it can get a little bigger, but I would think over the long run, it's going to stay at its largely, its, its current size, maybe a little bigger, a little smaller, just depending on how things go. Um, but if you will, the issue of the government getting big is an issue that was fought and uh, had a result over decades long before today. Um, well, maybe that's a lead into the other part of that. So we've been talking about the GSEs. Um, what about FHA? That's a part of the market that's going to mm -hmm. experience an enormous amount of stress, very reliant on non-banks. Um, how do you see this yeah. crisis unfolding FHA? Yeah. What are the implications? Uh, let's get some facts out and then talk about the good side in, in terms of crisis resistance and then the non the, the problem side. Uh, FHA um, was designed to do uh, riskier loans in general than the GSEs. The notion was the conforming loan limit, if you want a mortgage above that, you were defined as a rich person and you could get a mortgage without government support through the GSEs or agencies. Then there was GSEs were meant to be kind of middle class, top of working class, and FHA was meant to be a slice below that of more marginal cases where if there was more subsidy from the government, uh, people could be responsible uh, homeowners. Below that, if you didn't have the finances, you should be renting. Um, FHA had a small market share historically uh, over many years uh, prior to the crisis, uh, single digit percentage largely. Uh, it, and I'm, you know, I'm, some of my numbers are with VA, so excuse that. Uh, it was a counter cyclical factor in 2008, 9, 10, and it grew its market share tremendously. Um, and started to compete with Fannie and Freddie as opposed to being complementary to it. 
Uh, and I believe this, the, the market share of FHA and VA settled in about 20%, uh, 17%, 20% uh, of new volume, 17% of outstanding uh, per my pie chart. Um, so uh, those are the basic facts. Um, what's performed well, because FHA is part of the government, no one is worrying about FHA's capital levels. No one's worrying about whether FHA is going to pay its bills or anything like that. So you have solidity because it is part of the federal government. But their business model is at the more marginal end. And what you have here is number one, in the long run, everyone is worried about the amount of credit losses there. It is the most marginal credits that get mortgages. That's what it's designed for. They do not risk adjust pricing. So there's adverse selection. They get the worst of things generally. Uh, so there's a lot of that. Secondly, many people equate um, FHA, VA, and Ginnie Mae, that combine as being like a GSC. And it is in some ways, but it's not in others. Ginnie Mae insures mortgages. That means it says to people, you own this asset. If there's a shortfall, I'll pay you. The GSEs buy the mortgage. The GSEs have a giant balance, two balance sheets. GMA has no balance sheet. GMA has no cash normally. So they have developed a system in which all the cash burdens are on everybody else, which are now collapsing. So servicers have to do advances for GMA through final resolution of the loan, which could be year, trouble loan, which could be years later with foreclosure. The GSEs. Uh, the servicers are on the hook only to three, four months later when the GSEs generally buy a mortgage in from the securitization trust. It's totally different cash burdens. Um, uh, Ginnie Mae suffered from being, as part of the federal government, there's this old law about triple damages if there's problems. So the banks stayed away. Ginnie Mae has about 90% of the book handled by non-banks and the GSEs, non-banks are more like 40%, I think, something like that range. So they're much more exposed to these weaker firms' uh, counterparties. Uh, the advances therefore crush their entire business model. Uh, just by, by uh, happenstance, just a few days ago, Ginny May creatively uh, took some very obscure legislative language about natural disasters and said, we're having a disaster and they say they're going to be able to borrow from Treasury to cover the advances, because otherwise all the servicers from them would default. Uh, so you're seeing a lot of stresses back and forth. My best guess is the government's going to work to relieve the current stresses on the Ginnie Mae business model, leaving you with the main stress of how bad are the credit losses. But we'll, that'll take six, 12, 18 months to really become clear. Um, I think you touched on this, but I'm getting a bunch of questions about the servicers, the non-bank non lenders uh, and servicers, and in terms of what the future is here, that uh, given this crisis, so we're talking about kind of short-term fixes in the long run, is there gonna be change in uh, the way these firms access capital, the ways in which uh, they're regulated, well, who gets to be a servicer? Are we gonna, in a world where we have nothing large financial institutions that can take this on? Yeah, so again, once the current stresses get addressed, the government just throw everything about keeping the system going, <clears throat> uh, they'll turn to what do we do about this? This could be a regulatory task force to review everything, it could be congressional hearings, all the usual mix <clears throat> that, ha that would happen heavily for banks and securities firms 12 years ago. Um, it's clear and you hope that the result of this will be fixing all the stresses that showed up this time so they don't happen again. Um, that means addressing the service or advances issue, addressing the MSR issue. The question is, how do they address them? How do they solve the problem? Uh, it is unclear at this time. Let me give you two examples. If the MSR valuation instability problem is solved by changing compensation for servicing, so there's no MSR, then non-banks aren't helped or hurt versus anybody else. In fact, they're slightly helped because they're the ones least able to currently handle MSRs. Um, 
if the advances issue is helped by putting it off on somebody else, then the non-bank services are fine. But if the non-bank, if they can't figure a way to put it out, then they're going to have to make it harder to be a non-bank servicer. And they are going to probably, at the margin, push more and more servicing back into the banking system. One could even contemplate the regulators throwing up their hands at some point and going, let's move it all back into the banking system. I think that's highly unlikely, but that is a possibility. Um, uh, my best guess is to solve the problem. So non-bank services still play a role, uh, a large role, maybe not as large as the one they have now. Um, there's also a series of questions, Don, about uh, looking at the difference between the homeowner and the, and the multifamily side. Mm -hmm. uh, we've been talking implicitly, I think, mostly about the single family side. Talk a bit about how this is affecting the multifamily side and do you see any differences in how this is going to affect renters versus homeowner or ability through the housing finance system to benefit yeah. renters? Okay, so we're into less financial stresses and more the economic stress. That is, people losing jobs, unable to pay bills uh, because they don't have their income. <clears throat> Overall, government is attempting to do something that's hard to do. They want to get money to the people who need it, not to a lot of people who don't need it. They want it targeted and they want it fast. Targeted and fast work against each other. It's very hard to figure out who needs it. In the case of single family mortgages, the core at this point is preventing evictions, but also doing the forbearance. The forbearances, people have to come in to their servicer and say, uh, I'm having trouble and I want forbearance. The documentation standards are very light. This is almost the honor system. Um, uh, so we don't know how much people will uh, take advantage of it. Uh, we will find out uh, uh, through time. Uh, but then you get help to people reasonably well targeted, you hope, with the honor system, and it's very direct to them. With renters, there's the, the, the owner is in the way. The apartment owner, building owner is in the way. So how do you get to the people? So there's uh, efforts underway to encourage landlords to give forbearance to their renters in exchange for forbearance to the mortgage. That's more complicated. It's taking longer. It was not in place like the single family forbearance program was in place. And so they're attempting to do that. I just, again, state that it's very hard to get help quick and targeted to the right people at the same time. The entire, a lot of the $2 trillion bill just passed deals with that fight and, and making different choices about different types of aid. Um, we have a lot of ground to cover here, Don. There's a million yeah. questions that, uh, but I want to try to start pivoting us a bit towards the longer run as well in a half an hour that mm -hmm. we have. One of the questions that came up, I think might help us turn in that direction, which is um, what about um, uh, the credit risk transfer market mm -hmm. and how is that, and maybe say a bit about what that is so people know what it is. How is that faring in this crisis? What does that suggest about its, its uh, yeah. uh, liability going forward? And, and related to that, I guess, is maybe and one of your favorite topics is the, the private mortgage insurance and its yeah. uh, situation. Well, let's just stick to what is usually called credit risk transfer, the new stuff. So one of the giant problems in the pre-2008 housing finance system was uh, mortgage-backed securities investors bought these agency MBS through FHA, VA, and the two GSEs, and they were made whole on credit losses. That just put the credit losses back on the agencies. I'm going to leave aside FHA and VA because it is the taxpayer absorbing it directly. And so you had, for their own capital, trillions, no exaggeration, trillions of dollars of single family mortgage credit risk in just two companies. In normal financial institution stability design, that's a bad thing. Concentration of risk is bad, you want it diversified. So this is like an anti-stability design feature because it allowed the government to channel help to mortgage holders directly, very concentratedly through these two companies. So, how did, you, how did we square the circle? We said, leave the system alone, but 
do separate creditors transfer agreements, mostly through the bond market, some through reinsurance, in which others then would reimburse the GSEs for losses on specific pools of mortgages under specific contract terms. And it was a, a vision uh, a few people had many years ago, I was told, and uh, the FHFA encouraged it with their first ever conservatorship scorecard in 2012. And Freddie Mac did the first transaction tentatively in 2013 with Fannie following. And it took off like crazy. It's to the point now where the capital needs supporting the credit risk is about 75% laid off to the bond markets, the reinsurance markets. But remember, to leave the system untouched, this, these, these providers of credit risk protection reimburse the GSEs for losses. The GSEs balance sheets are in the middle. So this took off and it's a vibrant market and it took several years to get more sophisticated and it's going great guns. It has never been fully tested through a cycle. Well, we're getting the test now in a very super compressed cycle. So where are the, where are the stress points people are worried about? Number one, you have outstanding all these contracts. Do they operate in stress? Will someone not reimburse the GSEs for the losses? The good news is the vast majority of these contracts, the way they're structured, uh, the credit risk protection provider gives the GSEs or a trustee for them 100% of the cash needed to cover the maximum loss. And at the end of the contract, years later, we give them the leftover if it wasn't used. So most people I know are assuming it will work as advertised, but we shall see. And we'll know in the next two years. Um, the next thing issue is, well, what about new mortgages coming in? Can you do credit risk transfer new mortgages coming in? And the answer, the markets are closed right now. I know Freddie Mac did two transactions in the week between the two Fed rate cuts. So those were stress markets. They could still get them away, but you can't do them now. What's the impact of that? The impact of that does, is not that they can't make mortgages or, or buy mortgages in. What it means is they sit on the mortgages and the mortgage credit risk for longer until the market opens up, six months, 12 months, 18 months. Since they used to sit on the credit risk for 30 years, this doesn't seem to be that big a problem, certainly in conservatorship. But everyone's looking at this. I will note that the secondary trading of the existing deals, they're trading at quite depressed prices because the market is looking for liquid instruments and these are relatively structured low liquidity instruments. But that's just market stresses, it doesn't mean that much. So uh, we'll see how it goes. Uh, but I think most people are optimistic it will work right. The mortgage insurers, which are now considered a type of credit risk transfer, but often are viewed very differently because historically they go back quite a ways, their business model is more problematic because uh, the GSE is getting reimbursed for losses by them means they actually have to be there to pay. And they are, it's unsecured. There's no cash collateral for them. And they're like the model lines the old days. They're in credit risk. They have laid some off on credit risk transfer themselves. They like that concept. But the entire promise of them on all the old mortgages has been put into question because it's not clear how well they will fare. The average credit rating, public credit rating of a mortgage insurer is triple B which means if they go under stress, which is likely to happen, they easily become a lot of uh, below investment grade. And the question is, how, much, how good a system is it if the GSEs have to hope they get paid by below investment grade companies over the next bunch of years for losses? It's not as good a system as if you get cash collateral up front. So it too will be tested. And hopefully this comprehensive review of the housing finance system I'd love to hap see happen Will, will demand model changes to them, just like they do about non-bank servicers. So the stress point is eliminated in the future. 
Um, I, Don, there's a whole host of questions that folks are yeah. watching at home about the intricacies of forbearance and how this is going to work. Um, I really want to play to your strength, and so I'm going to defer on those questions. The suggestion to me is that we have a whole other event we need to have about trying mm -hmm. to understand what the response is going to be to this crisis. But I do want to get a little bit of a longer term view again of GSE reform. CRT is a piece of it that has helped right. to kind of de-risk the GSEs in your view. Um, you know, the beginning of your time as a fellow last summer, I think when your first piece was GSE reform, uh, mostly done, question mark. Um, and I think, and if I, I would just refer folks, if you go to the Joint Center's uh, webpage and you search for Don Layton's blogs, you'll find a whole host of these things that mirror a lot of the conversation we're having here tonight. But I want to kind of jump fast forward, which is as of last year, when Mark Calabria became the director of FHFA, he jump-started a process to release the GSEs from conservatorship um, and uh, bypassing what's referred to as right. legislative reform, where Congress would act and saying within his powers, he has the ability to release the GSEs essentially under the old charter. Um, let's, I guess, first part of the question is up to three weeks ago, how is that process working? What was the prognosis for it? And, and how has this pandemic changed that? Yeah. Uh, let's go to the before the pandemic. Uh, yeah, Mark Calabria came in. Um, I don't want to use his, him alone, but he and the administration he came from wanted to do an exit of the GSEs from conservatorship. That was stated as an objective by Steve Mnuchin, the Secretary of the Treasury, when he took the job. And they waited, it, it seemed they largely waited for studying things, but also until a, uh, a member of their administration was put into the job rather than Mel Watt, who as a Democrat was someone maybe they didn't want to work with on this uh, tough issue. So they, Mark Calabria came in, I believe it was late April. Uh, and in early September, the administration released its plan for GSE reform. And it referred to both legislative reform, how it should look if Congress could make legislation and change laws. But it basically said, if that's not going to happen, we can't just let it sit. We're going to move forward with administrative reform, meaning reform that could be arranged via the FHFA, but I want to stress, and also Treasury. Now, let me stop for a second. Director Calabria has been very public in his. Uh, uh, time at the FHFA, lots of speeches, lots of interviews, and he is very dedicated to setting the GSEs up to be released from conservatorship. There's legally released from conservatorship, and then there's being recapitalized so they can be fully healthy companies. These two overlap, but they're not the same. To be released and have inadequate capital only gets you halfway home. And the issue of being able to raise capital, the FHFA and Mark Calabria can get the GSEs ready to issue. They can retain earnings or they can go issue new equity. If you don't want to wait five, six, seven years, uh, you have to not just allow retained earnings, you have to uh, uh, raise equity. Treasury is a joint partner with the FHFA at this. Some things FHFA can do on its own. Some things Treasury can do on its own, some they have to do together, but in reality, because it all has to hang together, they have to do pretty much everything relatively together. And major issues are more in the Treasury side. For example, there's, over, there's gonna be over $200 billion of senior preferred that Treasury put into the companies. What's gonna happen to this? Who's gonna buy a share of the common unless you know what happens to this stuff ahead of time? Could it be waived? Could it be converted to equity? If it's converted to equity, what's the exchange ratio? No one's gonna invest until you know this answer. Or another one, much narrower, but showing you the political issues that are very sensitive that so far the administration has not wanted to face. Going on, after in administrative reform, the government will still support the company with the current support agreements amended and they're gonna charge for it. They're gonna charge a fee for it. Um, what's that fee? Well, they started to let the company in, prior to uh, middle of last year, the companies pay for that support by sending all their profits in. Prior to that, they paid a 10% coupon on it. What's it gonna be going forward? 
Will it be five basis points on the balance sheet or 10? The, and these are large numbers. In se late September, they stopped sending all the profits in. They said, retain your earnings. Well, then how does the taxpayer get compensated for that support? And we all expected them to announce the fee. They didn't. It was a controversial issue. They held back and they chose a rather unsustainable way to do it, which is the senior preferred goes up every, for a dollar, for every dollar of retained earnings. In which case the, GS, the common shareholders are, are going nowhere. So um, without getting overly complicated here, because this is always complicated stuff, um, uh, the reality is treasury has a ton of issues to face. Uh, they have to integrate with what Director Calabria is doing. They have to show up in a revised PSPA, and it's highly political. Uh, if, the tr if the administration were to announce, for example, that the $200 billion of senior preferred is to be waived, that would become the accusation from Democrats and maybe Republicans in Congress was that was a giveaway to Wall Street. In addition, some of these things are tied up in court cases, and you can't tell the timing of how those get resolved. So it's very complicated. And I wrote that article uh, a little while ago that basically says there's a long list of things to do. Treasury has announced nothing of it. And so it's going to take longer, not shorter, longer. And I thought there'd be more retained earnings as a result. I note that Mark Calabria's estimate of getting going and getting out and raising equity has moved back as he's learned more about it. Uh, and then you enter the pandemic. I'm sorry, Treasury is going to prioritize everything related to the pandemic and not GSE reform. I think FHFA, which would have loved to keep going in GSE reform, is being required to put their time into the pandemic responses. So, and then there's a question, you wanna issue unprecedented amounts of equity, sizes never done before in America. The largest uh, IPO in America, I think, was the refloating of General Motors, under 20 billion. The GSEs between them, after allowance for summary trained earnings, probably need $100 billion. Um, how are you gonna sell that when their P&Ls are up in the air because you don't know what credit losses are gonna be as the housing system heads down and credit losses start climbing in the next six to 12 months? Most people will say, I'll wait until I see it stabilize, and then I will talk about investing. So I think everything comes together on it taking longer, not shorter. So uh, one of the questions uh, that came in, Don, is about the Common Securitization Solutions uh, mm -hmm. entity and uh, what's the future of that, I guess, in particular now. And is there, the question was, I uh, was also saying whether or not it could be opened up to J yeah. JFA, other, other sources of, uh, yeah. Um, so in my time in Washington, because I had not been involved in Washington before, I found that sometimes there were uh, sort of a, 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 a working, a workmanlike view of things that you knew how they worked and, and such, and then a more aspirational political or policy view. Uh, common securitization solutions, or I tend to think of the CSP, the common securitization platform is designed at great cost, about $2 billion in many years to just service uh, the securitization activities of the two GSEs. There's this higher level policy, and that's the workmanlike answer. It's just that, and it's not gonna be anything more. There's been this higher level policy desire that somehow you could have the PLS market enter it, and sign up for it and issue securities through it. And, and that would help the PLS market be bigger. And I hear them, but when you get down to, and how would this work? Uh, I'm not sure I see it. The first part is, <clears throat> if you ask the PLS industry, are they interested in participating? The answer so far has been no. Oh, unless you subsidize it and give it to everything to them free but that's not gonna happen. So are they interested in spending a lot of money to upgrade CSP and change all their internal systems to fit a new utility? We haven't asked in some years, but previously the answer was a very firm no. 
They also were very concerned this looked like a government takeover of their business to uh, too much of a degree. So in fact, it seemed to be more inside the Beltway policy idea that I didn't find actually had much legs in the actual financial markets. Uh, never say never, but as of now, I would say this seems to be something where there's this, there's this great dichotomy between policy desire and industry actual practicality. Uh, I'm not aware the industry is actually interested to the point of putting money in it. Uh, so uh, we got about 10 minutes left. We haven't talked about Congress at all. Um, so Congress has been, had a long time to act on this, hasn't yet. Is there any uh, hope that they will act? And if they do act, what, what do you think direction they'd be uh, likely to go in? Yeah, <clears throat> I was told right at the beginning of taking this uh, job of running Freddie Mac. So that was 2012, so eight, almost eight years ago. And I was told GSE reform will only happen because of the fundamental vision disagreements between Democrats and Republicans. Democrats like the New Deal orientation of big government involvement in the private sector and the mortgage credit. They like the idea of affordable type mandates. Republicans want less of all of that and more private sector. And so someone said to me, what would ever cause them to agree? Number one, a crisis. Well, leaving aside what's happening now, in fact, the extensive reforms of the GSEs while in conservatorship led to a broad consensus in the industry. They're working better now with less defects and better for the mortgage, primary mortgage lenders than they ever have. So the crisis notion came down and down and down and many people are happy the way it is now. So there's no pressure to compromise. The other version where there will be a solution would be if one party dominates, majority in the House, presidency, and at least 55 or 56 votes in the Senate. And then one party can impose its view. And that comment to me then has proven totally true. And so there's an agreement to disagree in Congress. They have different views and there's nothing forcing them to compromise. You had the famous Corker Warner, Senator Corker being Republican, Mark Warner, Senator Mark Warner being Democrat, trying to come up with a compromise. It only got a certain way and then it just stopped because of the disagreements. Um. So time to make, I see a couple of questions, Don. One of them uh, had to do with the uh, the PATH Act mm -hmm. uh, and, the, and the the path it um, it laid out. And then the question was, um, do you think that what it laid out were feasible solutions for mitigating the GSC's exorbitant role in the housing market? Yeah. Um, again, this is the philosophy issue. The PATH Act was introduced roughly, I think, 2014-15 by the then chairman of the House Financial Services Committee named Jeb Henseling, generally referred to as a Tea Party Republican, very private sector oriented. And this original bill was basically to wind down the GSEs and just uh, assume the private sector would make up for the difference with a few bells and whistles around that. Um, I will note that while he was able to get it passed in his committee, at that time, the Republicans controlled the House, and in the House, a, a majority rules. There's no 60 vote type thing. The bill was considered so extreme or so risky that it did not even pass muster with the Republican majority on its own. That is, it was never brought up to the floor of the House. But Dan, let me, let me, we only have a few minutes left. So but to the extent, whether it has politically viable or not, I guess maybe the bigger question is, do you think the fact that the GSEs have such a huge role in the market is a big problem that we need to shrink it? Yeah, okay, I'm a pragmatist. No one has figured out how to keep the 30-year fixed rate, what's called the American mortgage, the 30-year fixed rate, free prepayment anytime, lock up the rate a few months ahead of time mortgage. That is enabled by the GSEs and FHA and VA. That is government supported issuance where the MBS has government support so it's no credit. 
and uh, you can trade that, and that enables this interest rate, complicated interest rate environment. Um, if you don't have that, the banks can't provide that past a certain modest point. They used to try, that was called the thrifts, and they blew up when interest rates and rates went up in the 80s. So there is no known solution in which you have a much, much smaller role in the government than the GSEs or FHA, VA, and still maintain the 30-year fixed rate in the trillions of dollars necessary for the broad middle class. That is why you get people going, we can't give them up because they're too crucial to that. Uh, I personally agree with that. No one has come up with an alternative. And interestingly, I personally view the GSC should be very heavily aimed just at that role, not other subsidies, that role, because that's what they enable. And this kind of mortgage is not enjoyed in the rest of the world. All right, so we're down to our last couple of minutes, Don. And I think uh, just watching the questions that came in, I think what people's minds are really on are where we are now and not the longer term. I right. think we will get, well, six months from now, a year from now, we'll be able to look at those longer term questions. But let me, let me ask you one last question, I guess, to close out. Um, is over the next six to eight weeks, what stress pressure points in the system are you watching closely? Where, where should people be paying attention to to see whether or not the system's going um, You want to see if the Federal Reserve programs to add liquidity quiet the mortgage REITs and the general stresses of low liquidity on the agency MBS market. The agency MBS market has been traditionally the second most liquid market in the world versus treasuries, and it's under stress now with very high spreads versus treasury rates. Is the Fed program working on that? They're throwing lots of firepower at it. It doesn't happen in a night. It takes weeks to show. That's number one. Number two, you're right on top of this whole servicer advances issue. Uh, are, the government is all over it, but they have to come up with a solution in the next three to six weeks or you'll start to see servicers defaulting. That's the keys credit risk of the GSEs or FHA is a much longer term issue. Um, so I guess maybe I'll, I'll also then uh, just bring us back to the GSEs. Um, you know, Director Calabria himself has said that he feels that the GSEs primary role ought to, ought to be a, a counter cyclical role. Um, I think more than sooner than anybody expected, we're getting a test of the kind of new GSE model, not quite fully baked yet, but um, uh, in a stress environment, um, how well do you see think, see the GSEs are functioning right now in their counter cyclical? Okay, um, the GSEs are functioning really well so far. They're not so much counter cyclical as not pro cyclical. They're just kind of flat. We don't know if they will grow in market share, um, which is what counter cyclical would mean. Uh, but they're still on the government books. They still you. Uh, Mark Calabria refers to their capitalization by looking at the equity ratio, of what they have on their books. That's relevant for certain things. For other things, like we're talking now, you have to include the capital call they have at Treasury. It's over $100 billion for each. So in reality, the capital they have to operate in the markets today is what they have plus their 100 plus billion. Um, and so they are immune to issues of uh, capital requirements, capital ratios, there are none, they're the government. Uh, so they are able to be stable or even counter cyclical with no problem while in conservatorship. If they were truly off on their own with a capital system, that would be more problematic because they would be hunkering down like banks are now, worried about their capital ratios as risks go up and such. Uh, but at this point in time, it's working really well, but that's not an indicator of what might happen if they were on their own. Um, all right, a big last question that you get like a, less than a minute to answer. If you had a magic wand or uh, all the political juice in the world, what, what's, what, how would you reconfigure the GSEs uh, going forward? Um, I would strip the GSEs down to their core function of enabling the 30 year fixed rate free prepayment mortgage. That means making them pass through companies that take, buy mortgages from primary, 
issue the mortgage-backed security and issue credit risk transfer in one form or another very extensively sitting on relatively little in the middle. That was the vision we were aiming for in conservatorship and that's largely what's been done. I would not allow large investment portfolios again. I aim at them at that to really be, make the industry the mortgage industry vibrant and keep that mortgage and that's the role. So that's where I'd go. What about the uh, the fact that I mean, entities like that, large, well-capitalized market reach, their role in potentially testing, making new markets? Is that a function that they could play, should play? I'm not sure of the question. Say it again. So in other words, uh, right, you know, under various things like duty to serve, they're, 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 the GSEs are mandated to right. try to extend credit to manufactured homes, shared equity. Right. Uh, is there a role for them to play as a, a maker of new markets? Yeah, um, the reality is uh, it's pretty well established in the real world <clears throat> that if you get uh, a privilege from the government, like a banking license or a securities license, or in this case, a GSC charter, social obligations will come along with it. Uh, as a, as a self-described technocrat, as you mentioned, that's very much a policy choice by the government. Uh, and so I'm relatively indifferent whether it's a bit smaller, a bit larger. I just want it to be well designed so it actually works and is not just a disguise for a lot of money being spent to things that don't work. Well, Don, we're at the end of our hour. Um, uh, I want to thank you for, for this evening's presentation. I want to thank you for all the work you've done over this past year for the center. Looking forward to more to come. Um, I felt like I've learned a tremendous amount of reading your, your, your research briefs or industry briefs. So uh, thanks very much for that. I would say thank everybody who's been uh, tuned in tonight. I think what we've discovered is that there's enormous appetite for uh, information in this day and age. I think we're going to look to see ways that we can use this platform to engage in some of the more uh, timely pressing issues that people need to know more about as well. So I appreciate everybody tuning in. Um, and I just want to thank the staff of the Joint Center who made this all happen in short notice. So thanks to Kerry Donahue, James Chavez, David Luberoff, and others. So uh, thanks, everybody. Good night. And stay tuned to the Joint Center website for more like this to come. Thank you.